Hello, everyone, and welcome to our MacSite sponsored event titled Beyond Affinity Antibody Discovery, Optimization, and Developability Screening from Mammalian Display Libraries. My name is Leslie Eschinger, and I am the Director of Market Development at MacSite. I will be your moderator for today's engaging session. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply submit them to ask a question box and click send. We'll also answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical questions or technical issues here as well if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I am really excited today to introduce our speaker for today's session. Peter Slavny is the Chief Technology Officer and co-founder of IONTIS and is directly responsible for delivering the antibody discovery and protein engineering portfolio for the company. Peter has led numerous successful biotherapeutic drug discovery campaigns with several resulting molecules now entering the clinic. Thank you for joining us today, Peter. We look forward to this informational session. You may now begin your presentation. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, depending on uh, whereabouts in the world you're joining us from today. Um, so uh, I'm glad to be talking with you about our main display platform. Uh, and I'm going to start the presentation today with a very brief uh, one slide introduction to the company, take you through uh, an introduction to the main display system that we're using, uh, and then go on to a couple of case studies uh, one regarding uh, affinity maturation uh, using the main display uh, and another on developability engineering. So the company is divided into three brands. Uh, we have a uh, Fair Journey Biologics, which is a service provider brand doing antibody discovery and engineering services. Fly18, which is a protein science uh, brand focused on antibody production, biophysical characterization, uh, and developability assessment to pre-CMC. Uh, and finally, IONTAS, which focuses on cutting edge technologies, which support antibody and protein engineering. Uh, and amongst those is the main display technology, which is the subject of today's presentation. So if we may start at the beginning, Beginning, the very beginning, I appreciate this slide may be very basic for, for some of the audience here, uh, but nonetheless, just so we're all on the same wavelength, there are a variety of properties we need uh, when trying to find a, a therapeutic antibody, which come together to make our desired you know, target product profile, uh, the list of tick boxes that we want in order to have a therapeutic. They include affinity, um, uh, which is in some ways a surrogate for potency, sometimes the relationship is trivial, sometimes it's not, as we know. Uh, function, of course, needs to do the thing you want, otherwise you don't have a drug. Uh, specificity, so that can be, for example, uh, not recognizing a close human homologue for toxicity concerns, or it can be cross-reacting to a species orphologue, cyano uh, antigens for preclinical development. And of course, finally, but no less importantly, the molecule needs to be well behaved. So you need to actually be able to manufacture it. Um, and that uh, relates to its biophysical properties, uh, production, immunogenicity, uh, and various other things. So not, of course, the earlier we can screen for each of these things, and in the higher throughput we can do so, the better the chance of hitting this sweet spot in the middle and getting the molecule that we really want first time. In addition to screening early and high throughput, it also matters that your assays, your screening assays, are actually predictive of the downstream properties that you want. So for example, your functional assay is unlikely to be a clinical trial, so it's a surrogate for the function that you need. Um, and likewise, uh, manufacturability assessments and developability assessments can report different properties of your potential therapeutic, and some of them are more meaningful or predictive than others for the final property. So we need to screen in as high throughput as possible, uh, and also using metrics or assays that are actually predictive of the final uh, drug that we want to make. Which brings us to how does mammalian display help us do this? So firstly, um, traditional technologies uh, have involved uh, individual 
picking of uh, clones, be they from uh, phage display or immune repertoires, hybridomas, um, or now single cells as well, um, and screening. So main display allows or should allow the ability to use flow cytometry or facts for selection and look at uh, many millions of clones. In doing so, you can gain information on the expression level and infer something then about the affinity, as well as the binding. Uh, and importantly, it will allow us to work uh, in the final format, which is often an IgG, but not always an IgG. And there are other very interesting final formats um, which can be useful to start uh, on day one by specifics, chimeric antigen receptors and, and others. Also, it will allow us to screen directly in the cell type used for production. And we got a lot more than we bargained for uh, on that one, and that's something I'll come back to later uh, as it relates to developability. And finally, there's the potential to screen for the desired function fairly early on. So if this is so desirable, what's been the, the reason it's taken so long? Uh, well, the key challenge here is to make a library large enough with a single gene per cell, in other words, to maintain the genotype phenotype linkage and have a, a working selection system. And our particular solution to that problem is to use uh, nuclease direct integration to generate library members. So it was discovered some time ago that by introducing a double strand break in the genome, you can increase the efficiency of homologous recombination about 40,000 fold. Uh, and this is true regardless of the nuclease you use. Um, so some of those are listed here, uh, meganucleases, zinc finger, tail nucleases, and of course, more recently, CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, and there's a crystal structure here of a meganuclease uh, bound to DNA. So we've used all of these, and our system is actually agnostic to which nuclease you use. The important thing is to induce a double strand break and drive recombination. So this is how the system works overall. We have what we call a, a donor uh, cassette, which encodes, in this case, I'm showing you an IgG with a light chain and a heavy chain under two separate promoters. But actually this is a piece of plasmid DNA and it can be anything you put into a plasmid. So it's really a modular system uh, and the input can be anything you can claim, uh, which can be of course IgG or other formats as well. And we've worked with several. It also has a promoterless blastocytin resistance cassette and homology arms at the left and right. And these match a, a target uh, intron in the genome. So what we do is we transfect this along with a nuclease. The nuclease drives a uh, double strand break in the DNA in the DNA in the genome, uh, and this drives integration of the transgene into the site of interest. If this happens correctly, this promoterless blastocytin uh, goes uh, in frame with an endogenous or is spliced onto an endogenous exon and gives an antibiotic uh, resistance marker, selectable marker. To do this, we're using the uh, MaxSight STX system, and of course, we're very happy with it, uh, otherwise I wouldn't be giving this talk today. Okay, so there are a variety of things we can do uh, with this system. So the first I'm showing you here is to check that the uh, resulting cell lines that are made using this are actually dependent on nuclease and therefore are being integrated into the right place. And you can see in this colony assay that we have a very high proportion of nuclease dependent uh, blastocytin resistant colonies. In other words, it's a very efficient mechanism for delivering the uh, transgene into the correct place. And we're typically seeing 98% plus these days uh, for these kind of experiments. We need to show that we can actually see the antibody. So in this case, you're looking at uh, uh, facts of a single antibody inserted uh, using anti-human FC on the x-axis and lysozyme, which is the antigen on the y-axis. I'm sure many of you will be able to guess the antibody that we're using for this. And you can see display and you can see binding to the antigen as we might expect and the relationship that we might expect between those two. And finally, but absolutely critically, we need to show that we can do this at scale with a single gene per cell. So what we did to test this is took a mix of two different antibodies uh, one against FGFR1 and one against FGFR2. Mix them 50-50, which is the same as one-to-one. -one. Um, put them into the system, generate these cell lines, and then stain with both antigens. So here you've got FGFR1 on the y-axis and FGFR2 on the x-axis. And what you can see is that this mixed population resolves itself very neatly into two distinct populations with very few double positives, less than 5%. 
So this shows us, and I should say we did this at scale uh, with millions of clones. So this demonstrates that we're getting efficient integration and that we're doing so in the vast majority of cases, 95% plus of cases, with a single gene per cell. And we are now uh, routinely using this system to discover and engineer antibodies from a variety of inputs. I mentioned already that the input is plasmid DNA, so it's a modular system, and we've used this in combination with uh, focus libraries from phage display, with immune repertoires and naive repertoires, and of course uh, with de novo um, engineering repertoires, so individual sequences which are being engineered. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to show you just one quick example. It's actually the first project we did uh, of an affinity maturation. So in this case, we were taking a PD-1 antibody. Uh, the parental antibody is shown here, put into the mammalian display system. Uh, and we wanted to engineer improved affinity for that. So by traditional methods, for example, NNS, uh, which we've done for comparison, you uh, see that the vast majority of mutations are deleterious. In, in the mammalian system, you can actually see uh, those uh, on the, the fax dot plot here, and you can see there's uh, relatively few that are, are good within that. And of course, space display and other systems are, are very powerful and can pick out these very rare events here. We wanted to try a slightly different approach, a more focused approach, uh, which we're describing as total synthesis. So here what we did is take the heavy CDR3, which happened to be eight amino acids, uh, and use modern uh, techniques for direct synthesis of every single library member um, and do so in a way which mutated basically every combination of two changes away from the wild type. So in doing so you get a set of daughter clones which uh, differ from the parental sequence by two amino acids with every combination of two changes and that works out as around 9000 variants in the heavy CDR3. We do the same in the light CDR3 and that gives us a combined diversity that's manageable within the system and that really focuses around on the wild type sequence information. We call this a, a search of the local sequence space. And you can see immediately uh, that when you do this, um, there's a much higher proportion of clones in this uh, quadrant here, uh, showing that fewer of the variants are deleterious, as you would expect with a, with a soft mutagenesis strategy. So we took uh, these libraries uh, using the methods I just described to introduce them into mammalian cells, made a library around the 1, 10 to the 7 mark, uh, did some fact selection, affinity ranking, some functional screening, and we're going to join the story fairly close to the end of the stage of potency. So what I'm showing you here are results from a checkpoint uh, inhibition assay. It's a commercial assay from Promega, uh, where blockade of the pdl one PD1 axis relieves repression on an NFAT reporter element, resulting in luciferase production. And what you see here are the parental antibody, uh, shown in orange, the benchmark at the tyin, nivulimab, or Devo, shown in red, uh, and a matured variant from mammalian display, shown in blue. So you can see we've been able to uh, engineer this antibody to have improved uh, potency relative to the benchmark at the time. In this case, the potency improvement correlated well with an affinity improvement, uh, and you can see again by SPR the parental antibody here, the matured clone from a main display in the middle, uh, and uh, nivolumab the benchmark on the right, and the same uh, pattern as we saw for the potency assay just previously. Okay, so I want to change tack slightly now and start to talk about developability and how we can use mammalian display for developability engineering, and also a little bit of the story of how we, we came to realize that. So I mentioned already that it's not enough to be able to have uh, clones with the correct binding properties, specificities, and so on, but we also need to manufacture them. So this means cost-efficient uh, production, uh, cost production of goods, um, and uh, often increasingly stable at high concentration for subcutaneous administration and of course shelf life and other aspects as well. So uh, a good starting point for this we felt was um, the Jane et al paper uh, which did a big service to the, to the field uh, back in, in 2017 uh, where they looked at a variety of clinical stage antibodies and put them through a whole suite of developability assays and really surveyed the landscape 
of the biophysical properties of the, of the uh, clinical stage antibodies. So there are a wide variety of different uh, methods available for generating antibodies. Some of them are listed here. And of course, whichever one we use, we all know that it's possible for things to, to fail later on due to availability once they get into the clinic. Uh, so we wanted to use the available data from Jane and colleagues um, to question, can we address developability with the main display earlier than would be done previously and also more effectively? So the place we started uh, was to go and reproduce some of the work that's been done using other uh, flow cytometry based selection systems. So in this case, what I'm showing you is a detection of polyreactivity, polyreactivity differences between astakinumab, which is marketed as Stellara, uh, and briakinumab, uh, which is, was withdrawn in phase three. Uh, and in this case, we're staining with either heparin or heat shock proteins. And you can clearly see that we can differentiate these two antibodies uh, based on binding to these, these antigens. In the process of doing this, we made an observation. So we observed uh, when looking at these clinical stage antibodies described by Jane et al, um, that there was a difference in the IgG display level on mammalian cells, uh, which was correlated with the biophysical behavior. Um, but interestingly, it wasn't sufficiently explained by differences in soluble expression. So to put that another way, um, the display level of IgG antibodies on the surface of mammalian cells appeared to be giving a measure not just of the ability to fold and produce them, but of the chloral stability, so of the biophysical properties in solution. Uh, and this we thought was very interesting uh, and worth looking at in more detail. So we went back to the literature and we identified some pairs of antibodies whereby there was a parental clone that had biophysical pro uh, problems. Uh, and an improved daughter clone, uh, which had been engineered to alleviate those biophysical issues, and also where there were similar levels of expression. So I'm showing you two pairs of antibodies from the literature described by Dobson et al. and Buchanan et al. Um, and everything that we uh, looked at from those papers reproduced uh, very nicely. So these antibodies have, uh, in the same system we're using for the main display, a HEC system, modest differences in expression, no differences in the melting temperature or TAG uh, between the, the good guy and the bad guy. Um, but do start to have differences when you look at the biophysical properties in solution, so chloral stability, and this is consistent, as I mentioned, with what's reported. So what we see when we put these into the main display system is that there is more than a log separation between the parental antibody, the bad guy, and the improved version, the good guy. So a big difference in display, but not a big difference in expression. And we believe the display is reporting the biophysical properties in solution of these antibodies. So we know we can separate a good guy from a bad guy. The next question was, OK, can we generate a library and actually select for improved variants from a library? So to do that, we went to slightly more detail on one of these antibodies, which is this top one, Medi1912. So here we looked at the positions which were reported to be causing some of these biophysical problems for the parental antibody, uh, randomized them just by NNS, and selected for variants uh, with maintained antigen binding and also improved display level on mammalian cells. And the table uh, here on the right shows you some of the data for that. So here's the parental antibody which again um, has uh, uh, a limited Cmax. If Cmax uh, is, uh, is, a, is a relatively uncommon um, technique, but it's concentrating the protein by ultrafiltration, and it's giving you the maximum concentration you can achieve by ultrafiltration before you start to lose material. So it's kind of a solubility measure. Uh, and it also has problems as measured by DLS with the Z average here. You can see the improved version, again, uh, recovers this Cmax and recovers uh, the uh, Z average and DLS as well. And we've identified a set of different uh, substitutions here, which uh, basically match the improved version, uh, but with different solutions at these amino acid positions uh, and as judged by the Cmax and also the, the Z average uh, and polydispersity index as well. Again, you can see the differences here. 
Uh, and I mentioned already that there was no real difference in TM and TAG for some of these. So this uh, was particularly interesting to us because for many of these methods, uh, you need a reasonable amount of protein and that the current throughput is typically tens, perhaps hundreds, depending on your setup uh, of antibodies that you can put through these kind of uh, higher level developability assays, which are reporting biophysical properties in solution or colloidal stability. But this opens uh, the door potentially to doing this on a flow cytometer, not at the level of tens or hundreds, but at the level of millions or tens of millions. And also to do so simultaneously uh, with analysis of binding properties and specificity and so on. So this is what got us excited. I want to give you one more example of applying this now. So this example is uh, Bokakizumab. It was a, a high profile phase three clinical trial failure. It started out life as a mouse hybridoma was humanized to an antibody called 5A10I. That was affinity matured by phage display, taking it from 300 picomolar down to 5 picomolar, but in doing so uh, led to multiple uh, developability red flags, according to Jane et al., uh, including evidence of, of self interaction and low specificity, um, and ultimately uh, resulted probably in the, in the phase three uh, clinical trial failure. And there was, of course, significant immunogenicity found, I think about half of patients producing anti-drug antibodies in this phase three trial. So we took 5A10I, the uh, kind of parent antibody and the matured version of Rokokizumab, put them into the mammalian display system. Uh, once again, you can see that the difference in developability properties uh, is uh, reflected by poorer cell surface display. And again, this was produced and formulated and went all the way to phase three, so it wasn't an obvious difference in expression. Uh, and we wondered if we can fix Bokakizumab by mammalian display. So uh, we looked at the crystal structure, which was available um, for Bokakizumab in complex with its target, PCSK9, identified residues uh, shown in here, uh, in HCDR1, HCDR2, and HCDR3. Uh, some of these were paratopic and some were non-paratopic. Uh, and residues in the VL, I should say, as well. So we took these, introduced them, uh, to make, constructed a library of variants, introduced them into the mammalian display system. Uh, and again, we're staining here and looking for expression of the antibodies on the X and uh, antigen binding on the Y, and we gated clones which maintained antigen binding um, but had improved display. And you can see that for the VL library, there were more paratopic positions targeted, and that's the difference in these two dot plots you can see. We recovered the antibody genes, uh, looked at the sequences, expressed unique antibodies, uh, and characterized them biophysically. Uh, of the 90 or so antibodies we produced and tested by AC SINs, every single antibody coming from a main display was improved uh, compared to Bokakizumab by AC SINs, but I'm going to show you a more comprehensive set of data uh, just for the most enriched clones by mammalian display. So what I'm showing you here is the CDR2 sequence in the first uh, column here, uh, and these are positions which were uh, mutated, and I'm showing you the amino acid that's been changed in those positions. Uh, this is for Bokakizumab. The three most enriched variants in mammalian display and the enrichment factor shown here. 5A10I, the precursor, and alirocumab, which is a common control that we use uh, as an example of a, a well-behaved antibody. And what you can see is that there's a big improvement by AC SINs. Uh, so in AC SINs, it's a measure of self-association, a high score is bad, a low score is good. And you can see that these mammalian display enriched variants um, are uh, in line with the positive controls, uh, alirocumab and the, the precursor, and obviously improved versus bocacuzumab. Uh, retention in HPLC sec is also improved. Interestingly, polyspecificity score has also uh, gone down for these antibodies uh, compared to Bokakizumab. There is actually, having said that this isn't all due to expression, there is a modest improvement uh, in expression yield, and I think we'll, there's an additional uh, benefit in cost of goods thrown in as a side order, we'll take that, but that's not the key driver of what we're doing here. Uh, and importantly, if you look also by DLS at 40 megamil, so this is quite a high concentration of protein and the Z average, you can again see that the improved variants are in line with uh, the uh, well-behaved allorocumab control. 
So overall, uh, we see improved um, biophysical properties as relates to solution biophysics of mammalian display and rich variants across a whole range of different metrics. I also mentioned that um, bocakizumab showed immunogenicity in its phase three clinical trial, and we wanted to see whether or not the engineering work we'd done on the bocakizumab biophysics by mammalian display had any impact on its immunogenicity properties. So what you see here is a T cell proliferation assay uh, from 10 haplotype donors, and you see those donors either separately uh, on the right or as a combined response index on the left. I want to draw your attention to bocakizumab here, which shows immunogenicity in this in vitro T cell proliferation assay, um, as do the controls. Uh, and NEI here, which is the most enriched mammalian display variant, as well as this other mammalian display variant next to it, um, which are in line with the positive controls uh, in both the combined uh, response index and also in the individual donors. So it appears that the engineering of bocakizumab by mammalian display to improve its biophysical properties has also ablated its immunogenicity, at least in vitro, in this particular assay. It's also worth noting that um, the mutations present in these variants, uh, which are highlighted here in yellow, uh, don't coincide with any predicted T cell epitope. So this improvement in the immunogenicity properties of bocakizumab appears to be an emergent property or an intrans effect of uh, improving the biophysical properties rather than any direct effect on T cell epitopes. So finally, I just want to start and try and tie uh, some of these things together into a hypothesis about what's happening here. So to do that, I want to just take you back to some data I showed you already, which is showing the top two boxes here. Uh, this is the display level of two pairs of antibodies, the good guy and the bad guy, um, and two, or maybe one, nine, one, two, uh, showing the parental in um, blue and the improved antibody in orange. And you can see this log difference between the good guy and the bad guy. When we do the same thing in yeast display, and this was uh, done by collaborators shown here, uh, this difference in display level simply isn't apparent or isn't apparent to the same extent. So this is interesting because this difference, which we know is reporting biophysical behavior in solution, um, is apparent in the mammalian system and isn't apparent in the yeast system. And that leads us to a hypothesis of what's going on, whereby in the mammalian system, antibodies are, are forced for a concentration bottleneck at the surface of the cell. So they can only occupy a certain amount of space shown here. And you can even, if you want, work out the copy number and the effective concentration in a small space. So that's one aspect. By contrast, in the yeast system, there's actually a cell wall uh, and the antibodies can be placed along it and the effective concentration is likely to be lower. Uh, and in addition to that, in the yeast system, it's more or less a one-way trip. So the antibody gets to the surface and that's it, it's there. In the mammalian system, another critical difference, as well as the concentration bottleneck, is that we think it's a dynamic system. So under that context, uh, we believe that antibodies which are prone to self-associate, aggregate, um, or potentially to interact with other proteins on the cell surface might be internalized and reduced. And so the display level in the mammalian system a forces the antibodies for a concentration bottleneck and B is dynamic, so is probably an equilibrium position requiring yes expression and presentation on the surface, but also requiring uh, maintaining the antibody at high concentration on the surface and not being internalized. So that is our hypothesis to explain A, why we're able to differentiate between the good guys and the bad guys and select improved variants based on colloidal stability in mammalian cells, and B, why that doesn't appear to be the case, at least in our hands in yeast display. So finally, uh, I'd just like to uh, take you through what we've shown today. So um, we've shown that you can display antibodies directly on mammalian cells and you can generate many millions of cell lines in effect of uh, antibodies driven from the same uh, locus expressed on mammalian cells. The input to this is modular, so it comes from a plasmid uh, and we can use naive immune or synthetic repertoires as an input for that, or of course, uh, pre-enriched populations from your uh, preferred engine of choice for generating diverse panels of binders. Uh, you can do this uh, in IgG or in other final formats. 
and you can screen tens of millions of clones of multi-parametric uh, flow cytometry as a sorting method. I haven't spoken about it, but it also gives the potential to screen directly for function, for example, by cells producing and responding to an encoded antibody, uh, or by direct screening, for example, of cars. Uh, we can do all this, importantly, uh, in the context of de-risking developability uh, of these programs. So we've shown that you can detect uh, clones with developability issues, particularly self-association and polyreactivity. Uh, we've shown that you can select improved variants of problematic clones. And of course, the ideal is to avoid those altogether uh, by selecting the right clone in the first instance. Finally, I just want to uh, thank you all for your attention today. Uh, and also, if anyone uh, is keen to know more about this, we're also currently recruiting multiple positions uh, and we'd be happy uh, for you to join us. The link is here and you can um, get in touch. Uh, here are contact details for IONTAS uh, and our other brands, Flow 1838 and Fair Journey Biologics. Finally, uh, we'll take any questions. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you very much, Peter, for that very informative presentation. So as a reminder, we will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you would like to ask, please do so now. You just click on the Ask a Question box located in the left corner of your screen, and we'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first question. Peter, were you surprised to see correlation of display level with polyspecificity as well as self-association? Yeah, good question. So I think initially we were a bit, but then, you know, when you kind of step back and think about it, uh, these are both kinds of alternative ways of looking at protein stickiness, basically. So, you know, um, self-association is the protein sticking to itself and polyspecificity is it sticking to to other proteins. So, so in a way, there is a kind of an underlying link between those two parameters, although we were perhaps surprised at the extent to which they correlated. And it's also something, an area of active interest, actually, to see if we can tease apart more subtlety um, in that area. And of course, you know, people like uh, Peter Tessier and others have done a lot of work characterizing the different kinds of um, developability parameters. And in that example, I think uh, Tessier describes bocakizumab as a kind of class three, so a, a polyspecific antibody, uh, rather than necessarily a self-associating antibodies. But clearly there are commonalities underlying those depending on the conditions you're using. Perfect. Next question slash comment came, because coming in from Toon, excellent webinar. Similar correlation between mammalian expression and biophysical behavior for non-IgG scaffolds, example VHH, and then has that been experimentally assessed? Uh, excellent question. Um, VHH is, has been experimentally accessed and there is uh, uh, the same correlation. And we've actually done work with many different kinds of, of formats. So um, one chain constructs, two chain constructs, three chain constructs, um, and antibodies, non-antibodies, different types of antibodies. So, you know, we strongly believe at the moment that this uh, display level correlation as a measure of biophysics is, is probably universal, at least the way we've set up our main display system, it's not necessarily going to be true. There, you know, for example, in our system, you have genetic uh, synteny. So for example, you know, these are all integrated in the same locus and we view that as a kind of transcriptional normalization. But at least in the system we've got, we think this is a universal feature, i.e. you can separate probably all proteins based on aspects of their solution biophysics, which is obviously you know, very useful for us. Absolutely. All right, next question comes in from Sarah. How do you cope with antibody internalization on the cell surface and in parentheses when incubated with antigens? Um, so that's a, so I think you know there's two aspects to this. So when we probe, we're obviously staining and we're staining using similar methods that others use for photosynthesis, so it's low temperature. So at the time of the antigen and the stain, we typically have a low temperature and so we're stopping internalization that way. But of course, when we're probing the antibody on the surface, what you're seeing is a picture that's developed you know, as an equilibrium over the time of culturing those cells, right? So the internalization will be a fun, will, will represent antibody properties at 37 degrees, the ability to maintain it on the surface as I described, but during antigen staining for the last kind of 
hour uh, or so of their existence there, you know, they're, um, they're spared that internalization parameter. But it's a good question. Okay, perfect. Um, have you done any work with bi-specific antibodies in mammalian display? <clears throat> Excuse me. And can you use the system to identify bi-specifics with optimal developability properties? So yeah, I guess kind of slightly related to the, the the previous question, I gave you a bit of information on that. So I mentioned we've done one chain, two chain, and three chain constructs, and that the the biophysical uh, differences or the differences, the, the ability to read out biophysical differences based on the display level applies across all of those. In addition to that, we've done some initial proof of concept work regarding the display of knobs into holes by specifics and the kind of optimized methods for efficient display of the heterodimer on the surface of the cell. And that's as much as I'm able to say currently on that. Thank you for giving us what you can. Um, next question. Do you use mammalian display for pro discovery projects as well as affinity maturation? And if so, how often do you use it for discovery? Yeah, okay. So I think you know, when we started doing this, we had, and as the, the first case study I showed you, um, into that we had it in mind as a kind of maturation being the core strength here where often people try to mature antibodies down to really good affinities and in doing so they kind of break them uh, and people uh, talk about the concept of needy antibodies you know uh, and so on and but uh, in practice actually the take-up has been on both and it's actually about 50 50 to directly answer the question about the portion it's been about 50 50 for discovery and optimization um, and so we do use it for both uh, although i think you know maybe the things that you're pushing for and the parameters you might want to select on maybe very slightly depending on the starting point and the desired endpoint, of course. Perfect. And we don't have any more questions in the chat, um, but feel free to use that ask a question box. We'll give it a couple more minutes and see if anything else comes in. Not seeing anything else coming in. Um, well, Peter, maybe I'll ask you at this point, do you have any final comments uh, or anything you'd like to address with the audience before I guess we draw the session to a close? Sure, yeah, thanks. Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, just to thank uh, those who attended for attending uh, and good to, uh, to, to, thanks for the great questions as well. Um, also, thanks to Lab Roots and also to MaxSite. Um, Labyrinth for hosting, of course, and MaxSite, uh, obviously, for sponsoring, but also, you know, we've been working with MaxSite for many years now. When we started dabbling this uh, in this uh, main display area some time ago, and, you know, the support has really been excellent from, from top to bottom. So, you know, we're really grateful for that and for the continued relationship. So, thank you. And we want to thank you also as well, Peter, for your time today and for your important research. Um, this it, it's it's been a great partnership, and we've been very appreciative of the work we've been able to do with you. So we would also like to thank Lab Roots for supporting today's educational event. But before we go, I would like to thank the audience as well for joining us today and for their very interesting questions. For the questions we didn't have time for that might come on on those submitted on demand. We will be addressing those by the speaker via contact information provided by the, at you, uh, from you by the time of registration. The webcast can be viewed on demand and Lab Roots will alert you with email when it's available for the replay. We do encourage you to share this event with email to your colleagues who may have missed the event today and visit MaxSite.com to learn more about our technology. So until next time, thank you very much and have a good day.